Hola, Matres Kyriel du Papillon from the Kingdom of Lokark. I'm going to be running a class on 16th century Spanish cookery. The first class, uh, I actually have two going on, so you might want to be, be involved in both. The first class, I will be cooking a delicious lamb stew and uh, starting that off, and it will be finished off in the second class. I will also be cooking marzipan, and this is a bit of a marzipan with a difference, so I hope you'll come and join me on the adventure. Hola everyone, I'm Maitres Kyriel du Papillon and I'm in the Kingdom of Lockup, which is to say Australia, um, in the capital city, Canberra, which is in SCA names Politicopolis. I want to start my session first by acknowledging the country on which I'm standing, which is the Ngunnawal country and which is owned by the Ngunnawal people um, who have never ceded their ownership of the land and acknowledge all of the um, those Indigenous people on the, all of the lands across the known world um, and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I welcome you to my class on the Libro de, de Koch, also known as Libro de, de Guisados, um, which is a book from Ruperto de Nola. De Nola, um, this, the edition from which I'm working today is a Spanish edition uh, from 1525 um, and is a translation from the original Catalan of, the, uh, uh, of that this cookbook was published in. So, um, and I want to acknowledge also uh, the translator of this, which is uh, Robin Carroll Mann. I don't have medieval Spanish in my um, vocabulary, so I've um, trusted Robin and their uh, translations for me. Today we'll be cooking two dishes. I'm, uh, I've got another class in the evening where I'll be also cooking two dishes, but the two dishes today I thought I'd throw together are a, a marzipan for invalids and a um, lamb stew, Cazuela de Carnel, I think that's right. Uh, what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to first explain that I'm, I am kind of cheating for this. I'm not cooking over a fire, I'm not cooking into, into a wood, wood oven, and particularly for this class, I'm seriously cheating because the um, lamb casserole dish uh, needs hours and hours to cook in the f um, fire or in the oven, um, and we don't have that. I've got an hour, so I'm actually going to be using a pressure cooker to cook the lamb itself so that that way I can have the lamb done and actually show you the finishing of the dish, which is quite important. Uh, so yes, forgive me for that. I have my um, Tupperware microwave, I probably shouldn't mention brands, I don't know, um, uh, uh, um, uh, pressure cooker here. So I'm going to start by throwing our meat into that. So I, I have written and provided notes for this, bit, but I don't know whether everyone has the access to it. Uh, but essentially, and, and for these recipes, especially for this meat one, I don't have any measurements because it, it doesn't matter. But anyway, I'm going to get this started. So I've just thrown, and this is about half a kilo of chopped lamb into my pressure cooker. And I have some lamb stock that I've made beforehand. One of the things I've really encountered a lot in... Um, Renaissance uh, Spanish cookery is a love of pork and a love of fatty lamb stock. <laughs> Virtually every recipe seems to, have to say, cook it in fatty lamb stock. So if you can ever get your, or mutton stock, so if you can ever get your hands on that, um, this is made from the bones from when I chopped up the meat yesterday. So I'm gonna throw that into the pressure cooker and get that underway. And then we can talk more deeply about things and start working on the, Okay. Um, we have a question. It says, what is in your lamb stock apart from the bones? Nothing. <laughs> this, um, it really is a lamb stock. Roast the bones, boil them, uh, well, simmer them uh, with water and maybe some salt. And that's pretty much it. So it's just essentially lamb. You can, of course, make other stocks, but... I don't think you need any more. This is a very meaty dish and it's very, a very, very rich dish. I, um, I, I will warn you of that because it's thickened, uh, because the meat is cooked in meat stock and then it is thickened with egg yolks. Um, that mean, makes it a very, very rich dish and a dish where the sauce is incredibly strong and rich tasting anyway. And so, yeah, it doesn't need anything else to it. And I have seen no evidence that there was I've seen no evidence either way that there is anything else putting stocks. So 
Now that that's in the oven, let's talk about the marzipan for invalids. Now, the reason why I thought I'd make this particular recipe is because I thought it might be a bit different to make a recipe where our sense of taste is perhaps a little challenged. Ma most of us have probably come across marzipan as it is, and so almonds, sugar, maybe egg whites, uh, ground into paste, voila. Marzipan for in invalids um, actually has chicken in it. And before you all quail at the concept, believe me, I've tested this recipe and it's actually really tasty. So let's go through the recipe together. It says, take a very fat capon or hen, which is very fat, and cook it with just your salt um, until it is very well cooked. And then take the breasts from it and the white meat without skin and weigh that meat and take as much peeled almonds and combine the meat and the almonds and take as much fine white sugar as all of this and grind the almonds a great deal and then the meat with them and then the sugar and then grind everything together and stretch that dough upon a wafer and make little marzipans of the size that you wish and make the edges a little high and let it be a little deep in the middle and moisten it with orange flour water and some feathers. Then sprinkle fine ground and sifted sugar over that water and then moisten it again and sprinkle it as before and then cook them in the oven in some flat casseroles and paper underneath and let the fire of the oven be moderate. And upon removing it from the casserole, the paper must be cast off each one in such a manner that the marzipan does not break. So um, we're going to start with our chicken. I'm, I've got some water. And, and I'm, the way I'm, now, it doesn't say to boil it. It doesn't say whether to roast it. It just says to cook it with just salt until it's very well cooked. I'm um, working on the assumption that, that, uh, that as a lot of meats were, they were it, it was boiled and potentially roasted afterwards. That's uh, a, a, the case with a lot of roast meats in kind of medieval and renaissance period. So um, I'm going to go for uh, ease's sake to just um, boiling the chicken. And I've got a nice chicken breast here. And I've got some water which I've salted. So I'll turn this around so you can see my stove a little bit um, and see my chip breast. And I'll pop that in too. So while that's cooking, and I've, you've got to cook it on a, uh, put it into, I recommend putting it into hot water, not cold water, because you, because cold water, you have to raise the temperature up um, slowly, and that's more time for bacteria to grow. So putting it into, straight into hot water start, prevents bacteria developing in the, um, in the Thank you, Vana. Yes, um, boiling is more efficient, and, you know, uh, you'll end up with a tender, more tender, moist beast, even if you end up roasting it afterwards. So while our chicken is doing its thing there, we need to talk about the almonds and uh, how you deal with almonds. So I've got some, some roasted almonds here and you can see that they are in their, still in their peel. And I, I will in fact, because to save time, I will in fact use uh, almonds which have already been peeled for the recipe itself. But I thought it was worth um, showing to you how to peel uh, almonds in case you haven't done that before. What cut of lamb have you used for the casserole? Uh, oh, to be honest, it's a mixture because last night when I went looking for lamb, I could only find extremely expensive cuts of meat and I was pretty unhappy with that. So, um, but I could find a roast, leg roast. So I bought that because it was actually cheaper by weight for us, um, for me, um, to, to do that. But, and so I chopped that up and that's where I got the lamb bones from to make the stock last night. But I also have, um, then this morning I popped out and found some, uh, went to a, a, a butcher and they had um, a halal butcher and they had some lamb curry, whatever that means. And so it was all just pre pre-packed uh, or pre-chopped a lamb and it's quite a fatty lamb with bits of bone in it so it's a nice kind of um, mix of lamb. Uh, here, here in Australia lamb is fortunately one of our less expensive meats because we've got a lot of sheep. Um, so what I've done here with the almonds is I've popped them into a bowl just with some boiling water on top and now all we need to do is let that sit for just a minute or so and then strain it and once strained get a tea towel and rub it between the tea in the tea towel 
I need to find a way to have a camera so that you can see the whole of my kitchen, but I hope you can see well enough when you need to. So I've strained my, my almonds, and then you can just pop them into a tea towel. Still quite hot. And you just rub them. And as you rub, I'll hold this up. As I rub, you can see the peels are starting to come off. And so at the end of this process, might have needed a moment longer. But the peel, because of the roughness of the um, tea towel, it will actually do most of the work for you and you'll end up with peeled almonds. Now in my previous class um, that I ran in the last collegiate, I talk, talked a bit about um, almonds and grinding and the difference between grinding almonds and um, buying already pre-ground almonds. Uh, I, you know, I think there's a, a huge amount of difference between the uh, product that you end up at the end of it if you um, just buy ground almonds. I actually have a suspicion, this is between you and I, that the ground almonds you buy in the shops are almonds that have been cooked and or, or um, boiled or, or made into almond milk. They've ground up their almonds, they've run the water through them and they've um, made almond milk with it and then what we're being sold is the almonds that are left. Now I don't know that that's, whether that's true but it would explain the fact that they that the dry, ground almonds you get when you buy ground almonds are not as tasty and not as rich and just don't aren't the same as when you when uh, some of the explanation of why it might be not the same and otherwise where do that well what are they doing with all those all that leftover ground almonds when they make almond milk for sale so that's my theory anyway but for this i'm kind of doing a bit of a modified process because I did I did make this with almonds that I ground in my mortar and pestle and uh, and worked well and I'm intending to do the same but because of the limits of the time that we have today I'm actually going to I've actually um, done a quick pre-grind of the almonds just to break them up so that they will grind in the mortar and pestle um, a bit more easily and won't take us quite as much time as they would otherwise. Now, this recipe is very straightforward. It's equal parts sugar, almonds, and chicken. So I'm just, I think my chicken's probably getting close to cooked. Look at it and see. Uh, we want to make sure it's cooked all the way through. I did put it in as one big lump. No, I think it needs a moment longer. Uh, so I'll put it all in the pan. Don't do this at home. And uh, just to you know, give it a bit more surface area to heat it more quickly. Uh, it doesn't actually take a very long time to cook. And once it's cooked, I'm going to chop that up just to give myself, a, a, again, a pre-start to the grinding process. Um, when I did a test recipe of this, I did do, put the whole breast in and, and ground that. And it does work. It's just that little bit slower. So I think if I break it up into smaller pieces, then it will actually um, be a little bit faster to, to do. Then I'm, I've got my scales here. I'm going to weigh how much chicken there is, and that's how much how much almonds, and that's how much sugar I'm going to add. Yes, I'm today. <laughs> um, later on in the recipe, it says stretch that dough upon a wafer uh, and make marzipans of the size you wish. So I had to do a little bit of have a bit of thought about wafer, um, and. There has been, I have seen references in 16th century English recipes to wafers actually talking about um, paper uh, made of like starch. Um, but I, I think this is probably actually wafers. I haven't found an, a um, Spanish period, Spanish wafer recipe, but I did find an English one. And so this recipe, these wafers that I've made here, and I'll show you ones I made last night. These wafers are made from a, an, an English recipe, um, which is uh, I, I've did a bit again a bit of experimentation with, and it ends up being about equal parts um, egg, white, uh, wine, and um, and flour. So about a, it ends up being about a third of a cup of each, and it makes quite a thin paste, um, which is then pressed into um, poured into a, a wafer maker and pressed and then cooked till it's kind of um, brown slightly. 
and they'll have to cool. So that's what I'm going to use as my wafer as the base for it. I could do a whole nother class on wafers, but that's another class. <laughs> and if anyone has any, comes across any um, uh, medieval or Renaissance Spanish uh, wafer recipes, I'd love to collect them. In fact, I'm, I'm generally trying to collect wafer recipes because there is, is like, like a lot of pastry recipes, there's not a lot um, uh, uh, of recipes around. Um, yeah, you can you can buy pizzelles or wafers sometimes, but often they're sugared. Um, this whereas this recipe from um, English recipe has no sugar in it um, at all, so which is interesting, uh, and I think more uh, well more neutral since for the dish. Although I, I suspect it wouldn't surprise me at all if they had put sugar in the, the wafers for that they that they used for this dish because of that. Um, uh, because this dish is for invalids. So the, when you think about it, I mean, normal wave um, marzipans are almonds and sugar and maybe egg whites. The addition of chicken to this really boosts up the protein. So for someone who's not well and you're trying to get them back into good health, having a, a dish which is high in protein and, and yet sweet and tempting is actually pretty sensible. Um, they, they kind of knew what they were doing. Now, actually... I will do this here in front of you, so I'm not bored by seeing. Oh. Where, did you, where did you get your waffle waffle iron? Ah, well, actually, I was just showing off my waffle iron, and um, uh, and I'll show you it because it is a fabulous thing. It, there's a company, a French company called Tifal, and Tifal make this waffle iron. Well, what Tifal make is one of these. You know your, your, your wafer waffle, your traditional waffle iron or sandwich press? Well, this is basically one of those, um, except that it comes with, uh, you can buy additional plates for it, and the, the additional plates include um, a pizzelle iron or a waffle iron. So that's where I got my waffle iron. Look out for it. Tefal, T-E-F-A-L, snack, uh, snack collection. So... A marvelous thing, and it kind of comes with. There we go. I feel like I'm doing a product placement here, but yeah, it comes with all these different plates. So you've got the one machine that does multiple things, and I was so excited. And the reason why I bought the, this particular machine was because it had the um, iron to be able to do um, pizzelles. So that answers your question. So our chicken now is out. Oh, and I've, um, what I'm going to do though, before I chop it, is I'm going to throw it on the set of scales because our recipe uses equal parts chicken to, um, to almonds and sugar. So I've set, set it on my scales down here. I'll just tilt that down so you can see. And it's 142 grams uh, uh, in weight. So now that I've done that, you can gaze a bit and make my cleavage and, and then Oh. To get myself a head start on my grinding process. Mm. At least now we know how much it weighs, 142 grams, so I shall get to weighing out my arms. As, as I said, I kind of did a bit of pre-grinding of my almonds before today, um, just that I was ahead. It's still a reasonably rough mix, but and I can see some whole almonds there. But I didn't want to over-grind it because I do want to get a reasonable amount in. Get that oils out of it. All right, we have about 142 grams of almonds. They go into my mortar and pestle. And then I will need 142 grams of sugar. Now, sugar is a whole nother question and a whole long dis potential discussion. Um, my, until the sort of 16th century, and, and this is my kind of studying come to what I've, I've concluded from my studies, um, is that until about the 16th century, maybe a little earlier, um, 
sugar was like salt. You know, you used it in the same kind of things where a recipe says put sugar in something, they mean, you know, sprinkle sugar on it. It's, it's to taste because it was incredibly expensive. Kept under lock and key. 16th century um, brought a lot of much, much cheaper products, in, uh, uh, much trust, cheaper short, um, uh, uh, sources of sugar into the market. And so the use of sugar became much more common. And there's a lot more complaints about people having tooth issues and <laughs> things like that. that become and when they got into sugar, they really got into sugar. <laughs> Someone asked if you could repeat the, where you got the recipe for the wafer. It's a French recipe, and it's from Le Menagier de Paris. Um, it's just here, and the recipe is wafers made in five ways. By one method, you beat up the eggs in a bowl, then add salt and wine and throw in flour and mix them, and then put them on two irons, little by little, each time as much paste as the size of a lesh or a strip of cheese, and press them between the two irons and cook on both sides. And if the iron doth not separate easily from the paste, grease it beforehand with a little cloth moistened in oil or fat. So there's actually um, a, a bunch of recipes there um, for wafers, so it's actually um, four different types um though it translates at, at five um it's a little odd um but anyway that's uh so there are there are uh, recipes there and the reason and where i came up with the third and third and third is i did some experimentation i thought well maybe it's a kind of thick dough because uh, it said paste and so i tried with a um uh, with an, an egg and some flour and a little bit of wine um and then i I put that in the iron, but what it came out, it actually rose quite a lot and became quite a thick kind of doughy um, wafer and wasn't wasn't very nice and wasn't crisp. So I upped the the, the wine and um, portions and tried again and then tried again and what I came up with with the, uh, as a final um, wafer recipe was the kind of third 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 um, and that seemed to work quite well. So now I've got my almonds sitting in the um, mortar and pestle here and I'm starting to grind them and if you are doing this at home and you're or you're doing this for an event or a feast or something like that and you don't have the time then by all means do it with ground almonds uh, you know uh, but I do recommend at least trying if you can at least once or twice to try and do it by using the mortar and pestle because you, you do get a quite a different product from when you grind um, these things in a mortar than you get if you just use ground almonds because the grinding process kind of releases the oils from the almonds and so it actually is quite important for the recipe sticking together um, and improves the taste because you get more of the almond flavor by releasing those oils so okay. Now I can hear, you, you could probably hear that beep, that's my pressure cooker having reached 20 minutes. Oh, it's been 20 minutes already, how can the time I'm with, you, with each other have been so short? <laughs> so it's going, and you can hear it whistling there. So I'll let that, that cool down so that it can, we can open that and do the second half of the recipe. But now let's get our chicken. I have pre preheated my oven so that these can go into the oven quite quickly um, once we've formed them and hopefully we'll get enough time for them to have um, to be finalized so you can actually see the final product. Okay, I've got the chicken in here. Chop that just a little bit more. It's good for your arms, this, this business, I have to say. And I did do an experiment with these without putting them on wafers to cook and just um, formed them and um, roasted them and they were just fine. So if you don't, if you don't want to use wafers, you can just put them straight onto baking paper and, and do it that way. And again, you could do this in a food processor. Um, I guess, but the difference is 
food processors don't grind, they chop. So you will get a different result. And again, the moisture comes out of it much better. There we go. Certain satisfaction to watching other people work, isn't it? See me grind. <laughs> And I'll turn this, tilt this a little bit more so you can actually see um, how it's starting to resemble a paste rather than just kind of ground hard. And I haven't yet added the sugar. Because it says combine the meat and the almonds. And then it says, and take as much fine white sugar and it's actually kind of reasonably specific about this so you are looking at kind of high-end cooking here with lovely white sugar who needs the jam when you have a mortar and pestle and you know having a good size mortar and pestle with you means you're never without an you know a self-defense weapon as well oh. Okay, that's good. Oh. And I'm trying to do this in a kind of quiet way, as quiet a way possible, and get the occasional clunk. Last time I did one of these classes, the grinding sound, we actually had to mute me for a while because the grinding was just a bit too over the top. Also part of the reasons why I kind of pre-chopped my almonds a bit. Oh, this is a lovely paste now. So now I'm going to add my sugar. One of the things I have found about cooking from Danola is that it is worth trying, you know. I know that things like this with chicken and marzipan and sugar, you know, sounds pretty weird and sounds pretty outlandish. But so far, out of, uh, I haven't found a Danola recipe which I haven't liked. <laughs> Mind you, I haven't tried cooking cat yet. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm, I'm quite up to that yet. Maybe next class. Oh, okay. Getting a good quiet to this. Oh. If you're going to do this with mortar and, mortar and pestle, I do advise doing a small quantity. <laughs> this is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, you can keep grinding for some time until you get this really quite um, fine. I'm going to, I'm not going to do that for this class so much because we um, have such limited time together and I do want to get it into the oven and out of the oven again while, we're, while we are together. And while that's in the oven, I will be finishing off the oh, meat dish. Oh, okay. I think that will probably do. I, I do like to have a quite a fine grind because if you can grind it in, uh, remembering the fact that, again, you're making this for invalids, so you're looking at people who potentially are older and who might not have good teeth, and so having it as fine a kind of paste as you can get will make it more easy, easily eaten uh, than we might otherwise get. All right. I think that will do for this. Oh, near enough for jazz, as they say. Maybe more a uh, uh, medieval term, near enough for, for crumb horn music. <laughs> I can say that because I'm a crumb horn player. All right, so now let's get our wafers and form our, form our, our, in, our marathon. Here, my orange flower water um, for, uh, 
for those. Uh, this is usually available for um, at Middle Eastern shops, um, sometimes Indian shops, but really Middle Eastern suppliers will be the the right place. And if you don't like orange blossom water, then at a pinch, I guess you could use um, rose water. Often there are, in medieval food, there are the two, uh, uh, you know, the two kind of favoured flavoured flavours. And it is not. Uh, not really surprising, really, when you think about it, that that um, they would be using orange flower water from because of that Moorish influence in Spain. Whereas I think the English English cookery seems to use um, rose water a lot more with marzipans. So I have my little my little wafers here. I'm just going to quickly wash my hands. and form, grab some marzipan, which you'll see is quite a kind of pliable dough now. And it says stretch them on a wafer. Anyway, I'm going to spread them on the wafer, I guess. There we go. And it does suggest that we make them a little, um, it says make the edges a little high, which is kind of weird because it says, then, then it says, and make them a little deep in the middle. So I'm guessing that makes, makes means that you're kind of making a kind of will. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, I'm making them with a little ridge around the edge. See, like that, almost like a little miniature dish. I think the one thing I would change so far is that I, when I next make wafers, I would make them and while they're cooling, um, press them uh, perhaps under a um, weight to make them stay flat. Um, seems kind of a shame to have such pretty wafers and then end up covering them so you can't really see them. But can't see the prettiness, but I guess you still have the lovely shape around the edge. Now I'm popping, going to pop these into the oven, and they're going to be at in a, at a at a temperature of about a kind of what we would call a moderate temperature here, which is about 180 degrees Celsius. Not quite sure what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's you, you, the rule of thumb for Fahrenheit to, to Celsius is you double it and, and add 30. So there we go. Um, that's that, that is for normal normal temper normal um, house temperatures, you know. Uh, anyway, so. Don't know whether it works quite as well for oven temperatures. 350 degrees, says Alistair. Thank you, Alistair. <laughs> These actually smell quite good. Um, but I think maybe I'm just smelling the orange flower water. There we go. These are not the finest works of art. If I was serving them to my Lord and Master, maybe I would spend a bit more time, A, with the grinding and then B, with the forming to make them very beautiful. I have my pastry brush here and I'm just going to brush them now with um, the orange flower water. Just to make them even more tempting for our invalids. Sprinkle a little sugar on top. Because one third sugar, just not enough for them <laughs> to keep our invalid happy and healthy. And return them to their health, state of health. A little more orange blossom water. It says to use a feather. Um, but we're using, I guess, our modern, uh, our modern equivalent. Right, I think that'll probably do me. Um, and uh, then I'm going to, going to pop this on a pan and throw that in the oven. Since to use paper, so I'm putting some paper underneath. 
So you have a, must truly be reasonably moderate, otherwise the paper might burn, eh? Hey? Anyway, so there they are, ready to go in the oven. All right. And then, then we can talk about Mount Meat Casserole again. And our mortar and pestle. Now, um, it is worth talk, talk, talking briefly while I've got the mortar and pestle in my hand about cleaning your mortar and pestle. Um, depending on what your surface of your mortar and pestle are um, will change the way you can clean it. Mostly you don't um, use detergent on them because it can tear apart the kind of stone it can get into the cracks of the stone and, and make this make it and make them absorb um, uh, the the water and then split but you do need to wash it out quite thoroughly and especially for a dish like this most um, uh, mostly we use mortar and pestle mortars and pestle for um, cooking vegetables or or um, grinding spices and things like that and so that's not a, an issue for food safety but of course here we've used chicken and although it's cooked chicken nonetheless it um, it uh, still can harbor bacteria. So it's really important that you clean your, your mortar and pestle really, really well. And you can do that by just kind of washing it out and scrubbing it out. And then um, I usually get some uh, rice, raw rice, and I grind the rice. And the rice then um, absorbs um, the, any anything from the from the mortar and pestle and throw that out and do another lot of rice, just uh, grinding it into the surface so that it will pick up any flavours and things that you might want to rid yourself from the mortar and pestle. So that's just a handy thing for your mortar and pestle knowledge in the future. Right. Now let's have a look at our chicken, our, our lamb. Yes, it does. I seem to have popped up. All right. Thanks to the wonders of pressure cooking, my lamb is all cooked. Smells fantastic. Um, but now we'll need to transfer it into a pan. Uh, my intent was to do this glass and put one load of, of meat on and then um, uh, have that cook all the way through the afternoon and then finish this dish um, in the second class of the day. But I know that for people on the other sides of the world, there's very few people who can do both. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, actually cook it a second time for the second class, I think. Um, or I'll, I'll slow cook another lot during the day. Mine is also marble as well. Um, uh, it, it, it depends a bit on the mortar and pestle, as I said. Um, for example, my this ceramic mortar and pestle um, is very absorbent and it will absorb um, you know, liquids into it. I wouldn't cook, I wouldn't grind chicken this in this in, in the first place because it can't be it can't be cleaned the same way. Um, and I have washed my my um, marble water and pestle with detergent, but it's not recommended because just like um, you wouldn't cook uh, cast iron with a <laughs> you wouldn't clean cast iron with a with a detergent either. But you know you can. And mortar and pestles are cheap enough that if it splits, you can buy another one. So you know. Don't let that put you off it. <laughs> so I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to turn to our recipe for our meat stew, which is a very simple one. It says, take a piece of mutton and make little pieces of it and cast it to cook in an earthen pot with the broth of the pot. And after cooking it well, take saffron and cloves and pepper and blend it with a taste of vinegar and cook it a little with that. So I've got my meat here, and this is about half a kilo of meat, and um, a little bit of broth. And I've got my mortar and pestle here, because, you know, as you can tell, I'm keen on a mortar and pestle. <laughs> um, and I've got here some peppers. Now what I'm using for this recipe is I'm going to use um, cubebs rather than black pepper. Um, for those who aren't aware of what cubebs are like, um, and they're uh, also known as tail pepper. Um, I'll try and show that to the screen and hopefully you the, to the camera and you can see I'm actually holding it by its tail. It has a little tail, which is why it's often called tail pepper. 
and um, cubebs were a uh, very popular pepper. Um, uh, like many of the peppers, they kind of got overtaken by um, black pepper once trade um, opened up in the pepper trade. That's another class. Um, so, but cubebs, I love the flavour of them. They've got a beautiful scent and beautiful flavour, which is worth trying. And if you can get your hands on these. Um, uh, do give them a go. I think I'm going to use for this half a kilo of um, uh, uh, of lamb. I think I'm going to use four pieces of tail uh, cloves. I've got my hot cloves here, and I'm you know cloves are such a strong flavour that I would be you know reluctant to to use more than one clove unless you're making quite a big pot of stew. So I'm going to use one clove and we'll see and we'll taste it and see how we go. And if if it decides it need, needs more cloves, then um, I'll add more cloves. And then I have some saffron here, so I'm going to add my saffron. Um, and I'm pretty rich, so I'm going to add a reasonably generous portion of saffron. I know that for some people um, saffron doesn't have a taste, but for me it does. Um, I'm one of those people who you know, can taste saffron where other people don't. Um, so do be aware of the flavour if you are making it. This is very easily ground compared to our uh, almonds. <laughs> almonds, the hardest part about the almonds is that they're slippery, slippery buggers, as we say in Australia. Um, and they just slip or slip around in, in, in um, the brine, so it's very hard to get them to to not skip out from underneath the mortar. I mean, I'm not a pestle. Uh, so there we go. Here we go. We've got our lovely spices there. And then it says to um, and cloves and blend it with a taste of vinegar. So I'm going to grab a taste of vinegar. Now for your vinegar. My recommendation would probably be red wine vinegar, uh, just simply because uh, uh, in period vinegars um, made a, would be made out of wine, and uh, red red wine is the most common type of wine because to make white wine, of course, you still are using red grapes, but you are um, not getting the skin involved, and so you know that's a bit of a more of a modern production or a bit more challenging. So I've moistened that with a little bit of vinegar, which has made this lovely bright yellow mix. And cook it a little bit that. And I've only used there just a splash of vinegar, maybe mm, a tablespoon or so. But we'll have a taste of it and, and see what it tastes like and whether I need to add a splash for more vinegar. For those of you who are, you know, uh, fans from from other from television show, shows, you know, you have your sweet, your sour, your salty. This has already got the salty from the um, from the broth, and it's got the um, sour from the vinegar now. So it's one of our balances of flavors. So there we go. And so we, it just said to says to. Um, uh, cook it a little with that. So I'm just letting that simmer for a moment while I separate my eggs. And cooking that vinegar helps to mellow it out a bit, I find. Otherwise, it can be a bit on the harsh side. So I've got some eggs here. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a big enough backyard that I actually have my own girls, um, Hanam and Betty, who make these beautiful eggs. And I'm going to, I think, just separating my eggs out here. Oops, I realised you're looking at the pot and not me, which is maybe better, <laughs> maybe worse. Um, I'm going to go for three eggs because I've got a reasonable amount of liquid here. And essentially, I guess, if you like, the, what this is doing is making the equivalent of a custard, um, but but with a kind of meat in the in the sense that a modern custard um, uses egg egg yolks to thicken milk. Um, but here we're using egg yolks to thicken water. Well, stock instead. So I'm just going to okay, stir my egg yolks a little. 
And uh, the key to this too is to not have the pot of stew boiling when you add the egg yolks because if you do, what will happen is it will cook all the individual bits of egg yolk and you'll end up with a sort of scrambled egg affair. Which nobody wants that, let's face it. So, and what I've done here and what I do is just to ease it in, is I stir in just a little bit of stock into the eggs. Doesn't say to do this as such, but it helps kind of thin it out a little bit. Introduce, you know, the, the, it's you know it's going to be in there anyway. The same thing. So we have a egg yolk there. With the leftover egg whites, I'm going to make actual um, kind of traditional marzipans or with or um, uh, macaron macaroons. Macaron. So that's. Use for your egg, left egg white. Again, I'm going to introduce just a little bit of a stock in. <coughs> All right, and then take egg whites and cast them within. So now I'm going to gently, while stirring continuously, thread our egg yolks in. See, I'm just, you know, I don't know if I can turn this around so you can see a little more closely. I'm just, gonna, just threading those egg yolks in. Just a drizzle of egg yolks continuously. It's smelling really good, I have to say. And it does say to stir it in one direction. I'm not sure what the um, significance of only stirring in one direction is. Anyone can enlighten me about why you should stir in one particular direction? Maybe it's just good luck. Okay, good. I'm starting to smell the, the marzipans in the oven now. Good. <clears throat> Hopefully, we have enough time to get one out. Taste. Well, they're starting to get brown around the edge, so I think we're going to you know, at least get them out of the oven enough to be able to have a look. Now, uh, egg yolks, you can see now that our mixture has got a beautiful colour to it. The, um, the saffron has given it a, a fair amount of colour, but also the, um, the egg yolks, because my chickens are free range, so they have brilliant yolks. I'm going to taste. This, although it hasn't yet thickened, I'm going to give it a taste just to see how sour it is. Not bad, but I reckon I actually could use a touch more vinegar. So I'm going to add a touch more vinegar to that. The vinegar I've got here is quite a mild one. Um, I'm just trying to get a little, a little sharper. Um, yeah. Heating up. This is a really simple dish, this one. Um, you know, it's not got any real fancy herbs and spices. It's got no, you know, gizmos attached to it. But it just makes a really lovely, rich, tasty sauce. Um, just going to let that simmer for a second while I have a look at my marzipans and see if they're ready to come out in the oven so you can have a look at that while this thickens. Oh, it's starting to thicken a little, a little already. We've gone from a really runny sauce to, to just getting a bit thicker. Just a touch. It is best to keep stirring it because, again, you don't want to kind of scramble egging and you don't want to get it um, too too high. So you don't want to boil it because, again, you'll, you'll end up scrambled in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Take this moment to pull my mask. Now, the thing I would recommend with the marzipans is I do recommend um, cooking them till they're quite, um, quite browned. Uh, that maximizes the nuttiness that you'll get from, from the marzipan. You can see here, the edges of these are quite browned, but they could in fact use a bit longer. Um, and that's why the moderate heat is good because you don't want to get 
it, it to get burnt, but you do want it to get kind of quite, I, I think it's really nice if it's really quite round. Just kind of pop those in some of yeah, I think um, what I'll do is I'll I'll kind of wind up by saying thank you everyone for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I will pop over to the Guimara's room so that you can I can keep cooking this for a little while and you can actually, if you have time to stay and um, stay for long enough for the taste test, then um, well I, I can do that. Um, I've just the only thing that this needs added to it is a taste of honey really um, and to finish thick thing, um, and so yeah. Thanks for everyone for your time and I hope you enjoyed it and I'll share the recipes around. Um, feel free at any time to contact me um, through the uh, SCA, uh, the Iberia class, perhaps is probably the easiest way at first and I'm happy to chat anytime and we'll distribute the, the notes around. Um, and I hope some of you will join me for the donuts, um, Spanish donuts this evening if you can. <laughs>